mean, if you haven't been here with us, this series we've been doing over the last month or so has been all about studying the book of Daniel, looking to get healthy, to get ourselves spiritually healthy, emotionally healthy, physically healthy, and, and following through on our decisions and living into the, and the challenges and the choices uh, that we make. And we're going to kind of wrap it up uh, uh, today. We've been looking at that story of Daniel, and, and we'll kind of mention it later on as we talk about it. But, but really, I mean, the problem I have is this. The series is over. We start a new series uh, next week. But yet this journey has to continue. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if you could just say, okay, you know, I'm going to do this for four weeks and it's all fixed, right? Wouldn't that be awesome? Or maybe, maybe not even four weeks. If we could just narrow it down to if I press a certain button, everything would be perfect, right? But, it, but it's a lifelong journey. This journey has to continue. And this week, well, on Monday, we, were, we, were, uh, we do something every Monday called the Good, Bad, and Ugly. Uh, some of the staff meet to talk about the good, bad, and ugly in the worship service. Goods are things that we want to keep doing over and over again in worship. Bads are things that we need to work on and we need to improve and get better on. And uglies are, oh, sweet Jesus, can never happen again in the life of the church uh, kind of stuff. And so we're evaluating and talking about it. And we got to my sermon from last week. And I thought, well, you know. Anyhow, we got to my sermon from last week. I'm thinking, man, it was good. It was good. And so I was waiting for Tammy to go, it was good. And she went, it was good. But you never answered the question. And then I went, what? And she goes, you never answered the question. You talked about how do we love God? And I was like, yeah, I didn't. Uh, I didn't talk about how do we love God. I talked about that to be in the lion's den, to go into the lion's den, before Daniel could get into the lion's den, he had to have such a relationship with God. He had to love God so much that something must have been going on with him, that he had such a deep commitment and faith and trust of God that he could go into the lion's den and really was wanting us to wrestle with how do we love God and wanted us to talk about that. And I left that question with us for the week. How do we love God. And so Tammy said, well, so are you going to answer that this week? And I went, no, I, I can't. I can't answer that question for you. I don't mean that to be depressing or frustrating or, or, or disconcerting. I can't answer it for you because I can't tell you how you love God. The question is not how do we love God. The question is how do you love God? And that is what I kind of want to talk about today. I don't know, I don't know if I have an answer for you, because here's what I here's what we want, or I don't know if you want it. Uh, maybe, maybe don't let me speak for you, I'll speak for me. This is what I want. I want it simple, clean, and easy. I want a formula. I want to be able to say, if I do this, A, B, and C, you know, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Simple, clean, I love God, God loves me, and everything is wonderful. All the songs we've been talking about this morning have led us to this moment where we've said, hey, God loves us. All the stuff Dan and Danny and Danielle have been, have been doing because God has loved them and they begin to work on it. But, but I, I want this clean, simple formula, and there's not one because it's a relationship. Now, do any of you have a clean, simple, easy relationship in your life? None of them. There ain't no relationship that, that goes according to the plan, right? And it... And, just being honest, it's hard work being in a relationship. People have issues. I don't, but the people I'm with do. <laughs> and it's how do you work with the, you know, and how, and, and then, then it comes into this relationship with God. I've got to, it's hard work. It's hard. We, we sang that song. We sounded good singing it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. You know that's a scripture passage, right? You know that's a scripture passage we've been working on. It's easy to sing. It's really hard to do. How do, I, how do I love God with all that I have? And I want this clean, simple, easy formula. Let me make it. Da, da, da. And it doesn't work. You know why? Because no formula will ever work in any relationship because every relationship has you involved in it. Okay, some of y'all are going to chew on that. Write that note down. No, no formula is ever going to work in any relationship because every relationship has you involved in it. And, and there's something about you, and I'm, I'm talking to me now, not y'all, I'm using you as in me, talking to myself in my head. You, 
that makes you you and that affects how you respond to every relationship, including your relationship with God. And there are four areas I kind of going to look at today. We're going to kind of jump around and then get to where I hope will be an answer for this is how I love God. And for you begin to wrestle with how do you love God. But the first area that affects all your relationships and shapes you is chemistry. All right? Chemistry. Your DNA. Okay, you, literally, this is the truth. God broke the mold when God made you. There ain't nobody else like you. Hit somebody and tell them that's the truth. Right? I mean, Judy, thank God there's nobody else like you. All right? And it's just, you know. I mean, you think about it. The, the scripture says this. This is one of our favorite scripture passages. Let's put it up on the screen. You are the one who created my innermost parts. You knit me together while I was still in my mother's womb. I give thanks to you that I was marvelously set apart. I know your works are wonderful. I know that very well. I love this imagery that God's kind of knitting us together. And um, I, it just makes me think of my grandmother, you know, grandma knitting together. And God's like, oh, this is going to be good. I'm going to put Scott together. Scott's going to look good, you know, kind of stuff. But my chemistry makes me me. You know what I am? I am an extreme extrovert. I don't have a thought that stayed in my head my entire life, all right? And that has affected a lot of y'all. A lot of y'all don't understand how I start talking over here, and I just work my way around, and da 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 da, da and it gets to here, and it's beautiful, right? And you're like, uh, didn't you say I'm so good? And I love, I love, this. some people come to me saying, hey, I don't know if you could, you know, doing another service, that's going to be a lot of work. No, it's not. I love that. That jacks me up. I come home on Sunday going, let's do something else. Man, that was awesome, man, you know? Because that's how I feed my soul. Others of you are introverts going, oh, dear God, shut it down, shut it down, shut it down. No. And some of you are like, oh, I just love being outside. God feeds my soul out, Don. Look at Don, not on the river. Oh, just, God just feeds my soul on the river. Give that man a fishing pole and a boat, and he, God is feeding his soul. I am stabbing myself in that moment. It's just, it's our DNA, right? We're all, we're all different. We're all shaped and formed together. So understand, when it comes to how do you love God, how you're shaped and formed together makes a difference. And then your connections. Now, it's going to be simple for y'all. Y'all can write these. These are all going to be C words. You should be able to remember this. Chemistry, connections. The relationships in your life shape you, especially those ones early on, especially those voices that spoke into your life early on. One of the things they, they told me is when you know, little kids need to hear I love you a lot because it imprints on their brain. And the voices you heard growing up spoke into your life. And, and those connections that you have early on kind of help you understand and how you view how you view and see the world and how you view and see yourself. And then as you get a little bit older, I can, I can hear my dad's voice. Birds of a feather. Yeah, the people you hang around, they affect who you become. It's why when I graduated Florida State University, I didn't speak to any of my roommates for another 10 years. I couldn't. Because anytime I got around them, I was not a good preacher. I was not a good Christian. I don't think I was even close to being a good human being at times uh, with them. And I had to make a break. Uh, and just in the last couple of years, one of my roommates and I have reconnected and seen how our paths have connected. And my other roommate, we tried to connect with him and realized, oh, still need some more time. Uh, you know? Because those, those relationships, those connect, they, they shape you and form you and how those people speak in, in, into your lives. And I was having a conversation with this week, and one of the struggles I had in 2009 is still one of the darkest years of my life because it seemed like everybody in our church got divorced. The church I was part of, it seemed like everybody was getting divorced in that moment. Um, and I went back and looked at it, and, it was, and there, was, there was a group of them. They all hung around together, and they all did everything together, and they all started going through divorces about the same time. And I had a conversation with every one of them going, have you found it interesting that all of you who are in this group, right, something happens like that. Our connections begin. So, so understand, our chemistry and our connections begin to play into how we view the world and how we view ourselves and how we view, how we view God. And the next one is circumstances. You really can't control your chemistry. I mean, you are what you are. And my children, as I tell them, when, when they start going, they whine about stuff, I'm like, you have this DNA in you. What more do you want? You know. <laughs> then they go, oh, thank God for mom. But that's a whole other issue. <laughs> you have no control over your circumstances. 
You have no control over the things that happen to you or the things that happen around you. But those things affect you, don't they? They begin to shape you and mold you and make you into, into, into who you are. And, and, you know, they, in, in good ways. One of the things I'm realizing, um, our family, one of, the, one of the struggles I have with God and have had my whole life is I've never had to struggle. I've never had issues. And, I mean, okay, hold on. I've had some issues. <laughs> But one of the things when I was coming through ordination, I still had all my grandparents alive. There had never been any divorce. There was no brokenness. My, I mean, I was, you know, and it really did affect, did I need God? Because everybody that talked to me about God is, you needed God because everything's so bad. And I'm like, things ain't that bad. So sometimes positive circumstances can affect it. But mine mostly goes to, we're affected by our circumstances of, we, we remember the pain and the hurt and the shame and the guilt and the anger and the frustration. Those things begin to shape us. And, you know, if, if you've ever been through abuse, and, and if you have, I, I'm sorry for the pain and the hurt in, in your life that you've experienced, that whether it was physical or verbal or emotional, sexual abuse, but that shaped you and that shapes how you view, view God. I have a friend of mine that refuses to call God Father. And every Sunday in church when we say our Father who art in heaven, it's like a knife going into her because of how she grew up and the circumstances she was in. If you've ever been through a divorce, it, it begins to shape you and affect you because you talk about this, I'm, we're going to love each other forever and ever and ever, and yet it, it begins to, how does this play in with, with God? Or if, if you've ever had a failure or a string of failures, or, or just it all begins, you, you, you understand, you all know what I'm talking about, that your circumstances begin to shape you and form you how you view things. And then, and then the last one, um, is your consciousness. And these all kind of build together, I, I, I think. Um, you think about our DNA and our, and our connections and our, our, our chemistry, our connections and our circumstances kind of build together and our consciousness is it's like all this wrapped up to one. And our consciousness is how do we talk to ourselves? That voice that just never shuts up. And you, it, 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 you've got it too. That voice that's constantly running through our head that plays back all these things, that says all these things to us. Do you know that you are your harshest critic? That you also lie to yourself a lot in your head. What's even more amazing to me is we say stuff to ourselves up here about ourselves and to ourselves that we would not say to our meanest enemy. Right? And we begin to believe that kind of stuff. It, so, so when I say I can't tell you how do you love God, it's because of all those variables, because of who you are. So you can answer every one of those questions. I, I can answer them for I mean, I, I, I know my chemistry. I know I'm an extrovert, and I know I like being outside, and I know that. I, I, I know my connections and my family and my friends and all that kind of stuff. I mean, uh, one, one of the things I have to I have an Aunt Wheezy. That's how old my family she was, Aunt Wheezy. I promise you, Aunt Weasley remembers Sherman, as in the general, <laughs> who marched through the South, and she would tell stories of, and she imprinted in my brain, this, this Aunt Weasley, Scott, remember you are a guest, that was part of our family name, you are a guest, you are better than everybody else. That will jack you up and mess you up on how you view the world and how you view God. But I can remember it being etched in, into my brain on that. And, and so I've got that with my connections and my, and my circumstances and the things that how they've affected me. I can tell you all that. So, so, okay, great. I have not answered the question and I have rambled for the last 10 minutes. How do you love God? For me... Whenever I don't know what to do in the scriptures, I, I, I joke about musicians. If you hang around musicians enough, if they don't know what to play, they'll go back to their roots. Like if they grew up playing bluegrass, they'll play bluegrass. If they grew up playing jazz, they'll go back to jazz. Like I have a friend of mine, anytime a bass player, he doesn't know what to do, it's a U2 song every time, right? Preachers the same way. I, we don't know what to do theologically. We go home to our scripture passages we love the most. For me, it's Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it was? Really, it was just okay? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it was? 
it was good, right? And God shaped and formed humanity together, and everything was wonderful, and then God put this stinking tree. You ever wonder why God put that tree there? Do you know how much that tree has screwed us up? If we didn't have this tree, and God, and God goes, look, you can do whatever you want to do. Have a great time. Just don't eat from that tree. And it irritates me that Adam and Eve did that, but I have three sons. If we told them not to do something, you know what they're going to do? What we told them not to. So I've started to tell them, you will not date that girl. Yes. <laughs> Got the right one in finally. All right, you know, I'm learning. All right. God says, don't eat from that tree. And they eat from the tree and everything falls apart. And there's part of me going, God, why did you put the tree? Because more than anything else, God longs to be in a loving relationship with us. God longs to love us. God longs to be in the, God loves us. There's no doubt about that. I don't have any doubt about God's love in my life. God loves me, period. But for me to love God meant God had to give me a choice. And God was willing to take a risk so that I would choose poorly. And there have been some moments I have, and I bet if you play back through your connections and your circumstances and your choices, there would have been. Right? But how do we love God? God gives us that opportunity when God says, here's the tree. We can choose to love God. See, I can't explain everything else about faith. Um, there are parts of the Bible that make perfect sense to me. And there are other parts of the Bible, I don't have a clue. I'm reading a great book right now called Inspiration and Incarnation, the Old Testament for Evangelicals. And it's really helpful and totally confusing. Um, and there, there are things about our faith that I can explain away to you. And there are other moments I'm like, like I don't know. I don't know why bad things happen. Not, not, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get into the question why do bad things happen to good people. It's just, why do bad things happen? If God is good and loving, why? I don't know. What I do know is this. All of humanity has some need or desire to orient ourselves to something that guides us. There has to be some story we align ourselves to that shapes and forms how we make decisions that, that decide what we do. And for me, it comes down to a choice as to which story am I going to follow. And I choose to pick a story that tells me God loves me, that he sent his son. That's the way I want to orient my life. And in that, that means I can choose to trust God regardless of my circumstances. If I'm in the lion's den, God, I can still trust God. If everything's falling apart, I can still trust God. If the world doesn't make sense to me, I'll just be blunt with you. If Donald Trump gets elected, I can still trust God. That's my own personal opinion. We can talk about that later, right? But I will still trust God on that moment. I've been, I've been praying, God, please let a dark horse candidate come out of the woods that nobody knows about yet. And it shows up and says, I've been watching the debates. I've been seeing the Democrats and the Republicans, and I've decided I need to run. Yes, I'm praying for that person. But <laughs> I can choose to trust God regardless of who gets elected. It's because Romans tells me this. We know that God works all things together for good. Boy, that's a hard thing to grab a hold of, ain't it? It's, it's easy, it's easy when, when you're winning. But when you're not, we found out this week that my uncle has uh, lung cancer that spread from one part to another part. We know that God works all things together for good, those who love God, for those who are according, called according to his purpose. I can choose to trust God no matter what. I will bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. I can choose to do that. Daniel in the lion's den. God, you better shut these lions' mouth. If you don't, praise be to you still. All right? 
I, I can choose to trust God in, in all circumstances. I can choose my focus, what I focus on, what I give attention to. Philippians says this is one of my favorite verses. From now on, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent, if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things. You know what you ought to do? Just ought to, You should go home and type this scripture passage out, print it out, and put it above your TV. Or put it above your computer. All these things you're going to think of. All that is true. All that is holy. All that is just. All that is pure. All that is lovely. And all that is worthy of praise. I can choose what my focus is on. I can focus to to put my focus on things that are true and holy and just and pure and lovely. Or I can choose to look at everything else. But I can make that. God's given me. I can choose to do this. I can, choose, I can choose to trust God in all circumstances. I can choose my focus. And I can choose the voice that speaks truth into my life. I'm going to throw truth in there for that. I can choose that voice. This is how the love of God is revealed to us. God sent his only son into the world so that we can live through him. This is love. It is not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice that deals with our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us this way, we also ought to love each other. I love this verse from Romans. God shows his love for us because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I can choose that voice to be in my head. I can choose a voice that tells me I was fearfully and wonderfully made and knit together in my mother's womb. I can choose a voice that says, I love you so much my son died on the cross for you. That's how much I I can choose for that voice. Here's what I know. My chemistry, my circumstances, my connections, my consciousness shape me. But I am defined by my choices. And we can choose to love God. The world, what's happening out there, may shape and form me. I I will tell you, I grew up in a rural North Florida town. I graduated high honors in my high school. I have a family who loves me. I I was pushed from an early age that failure is not an option. Bs are not acceptable. That's driven me. That shaped me. I grew up knowing this no matter what happens, no matter how bad I am. And there were some moments. I can always come home. But you will follow the rules. I've been shaped and formed together in a power. One of the best things the conference did is threw me out in the middle of nowhere and said, start a church. <laughs> you kind of me drinking Man, it shaped me in some new ways. Those things shaped me. My friends shaped me. Peers and acquaintances shaped me. Circumstances have shaped me. But I am defined by the fact that I choose to love God. The rest of my life is trying to figure out how to. I make that choice and then I begin to live into it. One of the things I loved this week is I sent out a devotional. And I said in that devotional, I ask you, um, how do you love God? And you sent me back your responses. I want you to take a look at how some of the people here love God.
every response I got back was somebody doing something. How do we love God? By the choices we make. By making a decision to choose to love God. We're wrapping up this story with Daniel. And he's not one of my favorite characters in the Bible. I like the stories, but my favorite character in the Bible is Joshua. And Joshua gets on a mountain one day and he asks the people of Israel, what are you going to do? Are you going to serve the gods of your forefathers across the river? Or are you going to serve the Lord your God? And this famous line, you probably have it in your house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then Joshua goes on and says, choose this day. How do you love God? The choice is yours. You can choose to let your life be shaped by all that other stuff. Or you can choose to make your life defined by who you love. As we celebrate communion day, maybe today's a great chance for you to take a step forward and say, you know what? I'm going to love God. You don't have to have it all figured out. But a simple choice that this is how I'm going to orient my life to this story of a guy named Jesus and the cross and God's love. And that's the step we take that changes everything. The scariest moment in any relationship is that moment when you say for the first time, I love you. You know why, don't you? Because if you're the first one that says it and the other person doesn't say it back, pretty awkward. This is how we know God loves us. God has already said, I love you. From the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks unto God, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. He said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took a cup and gave thanks unto God. After giving thanks, he gave it to the disciples. He said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. It is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you should drink of it in remembrance of me. So today, I want you to come in remembrance of all the things that have shaped you to this moment. And I want you to come forward today with the understanding that you can make a choice to choose to love God. And to wrestle with that question of how will you choose. Let's pray. God, we just ask that you pour out your spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of the bread and the cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. As we feast on them, we might experience your love and your grace. We know that you love us. Give us the courage to make a choice to love you. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.